Hey everybody, I got a video here for you today. This is my Q&A video and I've been putting together clips over the past week or 10 days. And it's been kind of a process, some information I need to look back a few years on what I had said about it and review some stuff, but uh, I just appreciate all the interest in what I have to say. It still freaks me out a little that people are interested in what I had to say. And I just, I've had a lot of questions on how did this all come about? How did you start making videos? What is your background? What is your education? And I uh, was not educated in ancient history at all. Not at all. And uh, I really got interested in it big time, maybe about eight or nine years ago. And uh, when I first moved to Vegas, I was a angry, self-destructive idiot. And uh, was doing a lot of really harmful things and uh, finally got my act together and stopped doing that. But I needed to replace the time that I spent really wrecking myself with something that I enjoyed. So I started reading about ancient history because that, I, I've always enjoyed it. Probably watching In Search Of as a kid sparked an interest in all this stuff. But I started reading a lot maybe about seven, eight years ago. But I read Fingerprints of the Gods probably about 10 years ago now. And uh, that really changed things. I was always looking for an answer to ancient mysteries. And at first I was into the ancient alien theory that provided a lot of, that provided a lot of answers for me. And uh, one of the first books I read were uh, Zachariah Sitchin's books actually. And I learned a hell of a lot in those books. But uh, a few years later, when I researched some of his interpretations, they were never confirmed by any anybody. But, you know, and people criticize him quite a bit. And uh, some of the things I have talked about where stuff is not properly interpreted by him. And he never really talked to anybody who wanted to challenge him. But I did learn a lot from Zachariah Sitchin's book. Uh, the Lost Realms was one of them that I really enjoyed. And there was a bit in there about Tiwanaku, and that really introduced me to Tiwanaku in Bolivia and Pumapunku. And that's actually one of the better chapters still to this day that I've read about the, maybe the purpose of that place. But you just got to filter out, you know, what really rings true with you and what doesn't. But the one of the things I learned that just because somebody says it in a book doesn't make it so. But researching the authors... That's one of the most important things that I've learned because people are writing a lot and it's agenda based and sometimes they put out crazy theories just to sell books and that's the same with some some people on YouTube. But how did this all come about for me? Well, I think uh, it was watching Graham Hancock and Joe Rogan talk on their very first podcast and I was thoroughly interested in that interview and I decided to make a channel because I could actually save videos and I just had no, no clue about YouTube. And shortly after I created my channel, I met a young lady uh, named Julia who really, really was a huge influence on me. And we started talking and we had about a two and a half year conversation on Skype. And uh, she really taught me a lot of the most important lessons that I've ever learned in life. And it's not the mushy conversations that I'll remember with her. It's the ones where she really broke me down and taught me who I really was. So she's one of the most important people I've ever met in my life. And uh, I found her on YouTube. So I always feel no problem with giving back to YouTube because that's where I found one of the most important people in my life. And uh, she encouraged me to make videos. And I would not be making videos today if it wasn't for one person, and her name is Julia, and uh, she lived in Denmark when I first knew her, and uh, my old subs were some of her good friends, and she is still doing good today. I don't talk to her nearly as much as uh, I would like, but we both understand, and I only smile when I think of her, but I do miss you, Peanut, and you are the reason why I make videos. I just wanted to say that. And when I first started making videos, I was totally uncomfortable with it. Like speaking publicly, it was like a nightmare for me. 
as a young person and I it was something that I was totally uncomfortable with when I first started doing it and I really I was terrible at it and really without Julie's encouragement and some of my early friends on YouTube I would have never continued doing it so big thanks to those people in the early days now I am up to I think I'll go over 45,000 subscribers this weekend and probably 8 million views in the next week and that really really freaks me out I was really happy to have 500 subs and just talk as a little hobby about ancient history in my spare time and really that's still all I do I don't have a lot of time uh, to make videos but I have done it so many times that it is becoming really easy for me to do and it's not time consuming or else I, I probably wouldn't be able to do it now I've had a few questions relating to discoveries I've made and they want to know like where do you find your information how did you become good at researching and really I don't consider myself or didn't consider myself a good researcher really till maybe the last year and I've been doing this for almost six years and if you want to become a good researcher do this make a thousand videos on ancient sites on ancient text symbolism artifacts layouts of ancient cities art from ancient cultures I've done about a thousand videos now on not all different subjects obviously some subjects I have repeated myself but I've made a thousand videos and when you when you do that it's not about like learning individual facts it's about just your mind just be kind of becomes transformed into the ancient way of thought maybe that helps but make a thousand videos on different periods of history and trust me over time because you need to if you make a video on each of those subjects you need to know about it make a thousand videos and see what happens see where your thought process goes trust me you'll be surprised now why do I make videos well because the history that we are taught and that is in history books is just highly inadequate incomplete and some of it's just very questionable and it's really when I read sometimes and I actually get offended at the history we are taught so it, it seems when I get offended that I become most vocal I guess now I've had a lot of questions on other channels ones that you would recommend and they are pretty much all on my other channel list here but let me just go over some of these um, Dendel of course she's just a very good friend somebody who I care about and is amazingly talented Graham Hancock all of you are familiar with and Brian Forster tremendous uh, videos here from these people Brian I'd love to talk to you on Skype someday for an interview by the way geocosmic Rex and sacred geometry Randall Carlson is featured on these channels these are very important and uh, if you really want to look at what happened about uh, 12,000 years ago check out these two channels megalithomania UK has some of my uh, favorite people on that channel doing uh, lectures and videos excellent channel Puka J they go actually travel to the sites and they make some excellent videos and I like those guys a lot Jimmy upright insight I owe him just a huge debt of gratitude for mentioning me in one of his videos uh, the one on Zayat al Aryan, and I got a lot of subscribers from you Jimmy so that's always appreciated and Carlos I've used some of his clips from uh, his John Anthony West tours and if you like John Anthony West please visit Carlos's channel ancient architects Matt over there um, I've been in contact with Matt I like Matt he has some good ideas and his channel is just boomed here he's already up to about 60,000 subscribers that's very impressive and he his videos are very excellent and he looks into a lot of the same mysteries as I do now Danny Welton he has been doing a series on uh, Pi and really going over some uh, in-depth work in that subject and his videos are always very cerebral and uh, my buddy Seth just a good friend who I make videos with here in Vegas 
Joe Blevins makes some of the best music videos on YouTube. Vlad 9VT, a lot of you are familiar with them. He gives you a good look around at a lot of ancient sites. Uh, my friend Callie, performer here in Vegas that I have featured on my channel. So, of course, I'm going to have her on my other channel list. Earth Ancients here, Cliff Dunning, he had me on his show a couple times, and that's always appreciated. And Cliff interviews uh, a lot of people that I have followed for years. Now, Charles Koss, his channel here. I like Charles, his imagination. He goes over a lot of ancient mysteries, some things that I've never heard of before. His videos are well done, and uh, they're always enjoyable to watch. And going on here, Demi Stelly, she has a huge following on social media. Just somebody who I run into and I become friends with. Uh, she makes videos on uh, different subjects. I first started following her for her nutritional videos and then uh, ran into her a few times and we just become friends. So I have her on my other channel list. And Enki35 Productions, if you like Sumerian history, she has many videos. She has researched that subject for a while and is knowledgeable in it. And uh, she shares or has shared a lot of videos. And that's why she's on my list, because of the Sumerians. It's not something that I have uh, dove deeply into. So I love having her on my other channel list, just if people want to check it out. But that is my other channel list. If you like ancient history, plenty of good channels to check out. And those of you who are not familiar with Randall Carlson, his work, I highly recommend. Sacred Geometry International and Geocosmic Rex. And uh, these other channels just have excellent information. And if you like music, there's a few music channels to check out. Some extremely talented people. Now, I'd just like to share a couple links where I get some good information from. A lot of it comes from here, and this is one of the places I wanted to share. This is the Pyramid Text Online, and this is just a great source. You just click on the pick, and it shows you, I think this is what is below the Pyramid of Unis at Saqqara. But you just go down here, and you can look at some photos and other things. But what's really key, you click on the library. And you have books at your disposal, uh, E.A. Wallace Budge, Flinders Petrie, uh, early explorers that were on the Giza Plateau and visited Egypt. You have just a whole bunch of books here. So this is one website that I thoroughly recommend, the Pyramid Text Online. And you can find some links in my uh, About section on my channel. Just click About. And that'll give you some links that I check out all the time. Now, one other website I have in my About section is John Anthony West's website. So please check it out if you have never visited it yet and you are only familiar with his videos. But uh, just has a little note here on his passing. And this is another person that is just owed a huge debt of gratitude. Because what he really started it all, recognizing one line from Schwaller de Lubitz's book that mentioned the erosion of the Sphinx. And he took that and ran with it. And he just passed the baton to people like me and others that do videos on Egypt. And we are carrying on his legacy. And he is owed a tremendous debt of gratitude. Here is his website. And I love that pick with all the books. Great man. Now, I have had questions on Facebook and Instagram and other social media sites. Are you on there? Yeah, I am. But I don't make a lot of posts. I do post stuff on Google Plus here just because I have about 550 followers. I actually have followers on Google Plus. And uh, I do post stuff on Facebook and Instagram once in a while. But... Trust me, YouTube takes up all of my time that I have for social media. But I do make some posts once in a while and uh, just stuff around Las Vegas. And to tell you the truth, I don't even know how to use Facebook and Instagram properly, <laughs> really. And uh, sometimes my friend Dendel will look at me like, you come across as a sophisticated guy on YouTube, yet you don't know the simplest things about using some other social media sites <laughs> how could that be but uh 
I'm learning, and maybe I'll use it a little more in the future. But if you want to follow me on Instagram or Facebook, I always uh, appreciate that. I'll probably follow you back. I don't use it that much, but I do check in once in a while. Just stuff from around Vegas here. Checking in on neighbors across the street at Home Goods, buying a new trunk, maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, but just different stuff from Vegas. And I haven't looked at these. Oh man, some bad memories there. But just stuff that I find interesting around town. Uh, Logan Paul, have you made any interesting videos lately? But I met him last summer and actually did a video with him. But that is just a little look at my Instagram. I've posted maybe 32 posts over the last year or now, so. Now let's start talking about some ancient sites here. Here is the Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun. Is this an actual pyramid? Is this just a natural hill? Is it possibly somewhere in between? I don't know. It appears to be aligned to perfectly north, and there seems to be evidence that says this is a pyramid. Other very open-minded people, like Graham Hancock, has serious doubts. It says the concrete here is a naturally formed material. Mr. Osmanovich, who is the champion of the cause of the Bosnian Pyramids, appears to be a very knowledgeable and upfront guy. A lot of this seems to be political. Countries that have pyramids say this is not a natural, or this is a natural feature, and they try to debunk it. This is just one of those topics I have totally flip-flopped on, and I don't know what to think. There appears to be evidence on both sides. I have no idea what to think as far as the final conclusion on the Bosnian Pyramid. But those are some thoughts, and I will leave some links below on some videos I have done on the Bosnian Pyramid. Now, one other site I have been questioned on is Yanaguni. And this is another one of those sites where just not quite sure what to believe. And Graham Hancock thinks, obviously, this is a man-made site, an ancient sunken site that went underwater when sea levels rose over 9,000 uh, BC in that time frame. But others, like Robert Schock, who's a professional geologist, and John Anthony West, who are down here, says that it's a natural feature. And sometimes the answer lies in between. Maybe a natural feature that man worked in ancient times because it was simply convenient, and it was right probably on the shore. But this is this, uh, Atlas Obscura, and I will try to steer you towards some good websites also in this video, but this is one of those sites that just seems that there is carvings made, and here is a turtle, and that seems to be a very ancient important symbol, cross-culture symbol. But here is some looks at Yanaguni. This is a site that maybe the answer lies in between, but there is a stone circle found underwater uh, not very close to here, but not too far away. That is clearly an underwater stone circle. So if there is something that's clearly man-made, a man-made monument nearby, shouldn't we at least consider seriously that man carved this ancient structure also? Just thought I would talk a little bit about Yanaguni because I had questions on it. No, I had a question from somebody in France. Have you ever covered the Kazakhstan pyramid that was discovered? And I have looked into this. And I would really hesitate to call this a pyramid. This is like 14 by 15. This is about as big as a two-car garage. So I'm, I'm not going to call it a pyramid or the discovery of the world's oldest pyramid. It's a mausoleum, a very cool ancient tomb. But I'm certainly not going to call it a pyramid. Now some uh, Egypt questions. I had one very recently. Have I ever done anything on the ancient shoreline out from the delta in Egypt? And actually about three years ago I plotted the 400 foot level where the ancient shoreline would have been. And it was pretty surprising to me. If this is a representation of the spine, then the ancient shoreline 
was a perfect representation of the head before sea levels rose. I just wanted to mention that. Now, Giza, I've had some questions, and one of them was on a second sphinx. Do I think there was a second sphinx ever built? And I did look into that, and I have looked into what other people have said on maybe a possibility of a second sphinx. And to me, I found no evidence whatsoever of a second sphinx. Uh, people say, well, there, there's dual lion symbolism. Yeah, well, what we know is a sphinx was never a lion in its original form. People have speculated this is what the mound of the sphinx originally looked like before it was carved. And maybe there is this has something to do with the second. No, there is some of the most ancient tunnels under this. This was never intended to be a sphinx whatsoever. And uh, Antoine Giegel, I love her research on Abu Ruwash, an ancient, uh, ancient island of Giza. But she has sp stated that she has found evidence of a second sphinx across the Nile. And she said it was made of mud bricks. Well, if it was made of mud bricks, it had absolutely nothing to do with the original building of this monument. I just wanted to state that. Now, I have had questions on a fourth pyramid of Giza, and I know ancient architects covered that subject just yesterday, I believe, and I find that pretty interesting, and I think Charles Koss talked about it once too, and that might have been based on the same drawings, but uh, not many. Um, Napoleon never mentioned anything, but there was a few explorers here in very, uh, the very early 1800s, and then some in the 1900s, very early, that stated there appeared to be some ruins in the area where that fourth pyramid was located, but that's something that I just take with high speculation. But a fourth pyramid, I did make a video on a fourth pyramid at Giza, and it is right, it is right here. And this is the tomb of King Kawis, the third or fifth. And there is a stone built tomb on top of a structure built out of original bedrock. And I did a video on this and there is clearly a causeway. So this was an important original structure at Giza. And it comes down to a pit down here that's all covered with sand. But reading the ancient text seems pre-dynastic kings were mummified below this structure. They were taken down here, taken on a boat, boat journey in front of ancient Anubis down to Abydos, and then were buried. And we have tombs of pre-dynastic kings down there. Is that just a myth from ancient text? I seriously doubt it. Now I have one question here on King's List. And is there one at Edfu and King Menes? Well, the rulers of Egypt come from really three different sources. One is the Palermo Stone. Another is the famous Turin Canon. That goes from pre-dynastic rulers all the way through Ramses II. And there, are, there is also a King's List at Abydos in the Temple of Seti. And it seems Seti had his hands on some very ancient information and of course the Osirian is found right behind his temple just wanted to go over that briefly now here's another question on that same video it has to do with brian forrester's uh dna research into the uh elongated skull that he found in peru it says like he says will the academics take up the challenge investigate write papers and update history well i kind of seriously doubt it History changes very, very slowly, and new ideas really have to get really put through the process, and a lot of people really need to take up belief in certain issues, and it's really tough. Academics are very rigid. They have a very dim, narrow view of history, and it doesn't change very easily, but who knows? It does change eventually, and I think eventually people like Graham Hancock and Randall Carlson are going to be in the history books. Here's another question. How do you get the high 
resolution satellite images. Well, I just used the newest version of Google Earth. And then after somebody complained, <laughs> I make sure I always upload my videos now in the highest resolution possible. That was a good comment back then because sometimes I just didn't pay attention. I just uploaded it and would just forget to do it in HD. So good comments, good questions. Now here's a video I uploaded last week and we'll just look at a few questions here. And it says, what are these people hiding? Well, I just think they're hiding prehistory, something that they can't attribute to any period of dynastic history going on here. Let's find another question. I know there's one coming up right away. It says, I see the encroaching, or the houses encroaching on these ancient sites. Is there any evidence that maybe the houses already encroached over the ancient sites? Like, we'll never know because somebody's house is in the way now. Well, Graham Hancock has said, if you sit on the edge of the Giza Plateau, you can hear people digging, literally jackhammering beneath their basements. So there is a constant search for artifacts, and I'm sure there are people have been searching for artifacts in this area for thousands of years. But is there stuff still to be discovered under Giza? Man, that is a tough question. And I kind of seriously doubt if we're going to make any significant discoveries. Stuff was probably already discovered. And then places were sealed up so you could never get into them again. But I am going to be talking about a few places on the Giza Plateau in the near future that maybe you have never heard about. Now, another question I had was if you go back to any period in history, what would that be? Well, it would probably be when the people first started laying the stones on these structures. Who were they? When was that? What the heck was going on? But a few other questions on this video. What do you think of the hypothesis that if there ever was a Garden of Eden, that it would be in Egypt's Nile Delta? And I have actually uploaded a video on that subject. I thought that was very interesting. But it just seems to me the whole Garden of Eden thing, it seems to come from the area of Gobekli Tepe in ancient Haran, and Sogmatar, and some of the most ancient places that agriculture and civilization seem to sprout out of. Gobekli Tepe goes back a long, long time, 10, 12,000 years, and that just seems to be the area that makes the most sense to me. Though, I did find the idea of it being in the Nile Delta, the Garden of Eden, well, I found that interesting at one point, and I still don't dismiss it 100%. Now here's another question. What do you know about the underground tunnels found at the Temple of the Birds? Well, I think there's actually another name for that, and I just may be making a video on that subject that is found at Giza, and I think that's what you're talking about. Now here's another question on the Osiris Shaft video. Have you found out any more about it? What the hell is that thing at 758? And referring to this item here and i have not found out any more about it just because i haven't researched it anymore maybe i might somebody left a comment that i guess this is shown on a diagram on brian forster's website now one thing i should mention is they did some imaging radar imaging what was underneath here and it was kind of hazy but it appeared to show an opening and there, they suggested that this opening led to a shaft that led down to the Sphinx. Or it could have just been an opening inside of this enormous megalith. What is this? I have not looked into it. And I've been going over my comments, and I'm just not sure what this is at all. But to me, I just can't ignore the fact that in the most ancient sacred texts coming from the earliest Egyptians... They say that ancient Anubis sat upon the box coffin of Orion. And of course, Osiris and Orion, they're intermixed. A word called Sahu, the souls, the spirit, and the afterlife in Orion. It's all the same thing. And the Sphinx was originally Anubis, and he is sitting up above this area. Well, 
to me, this just kind of confirms what the ancient text says, that ancient Anubis was sitting upon the box coffin of Orion. Now, some questions on my Devil's Punch Bowl video. One from Sandra here. Do any tunnels represent any symbols, dump site, possible ancient energy types? Well, that's a good question. I don't dismiss the energy connection. Today we put our most uh, serious efforts into our most massive structures, and they result in something that is beneficial to the culture, energy. Did they do this in ancient times? I don't dismiss that. Were they trying to cover something up, something that was possibly harmful, like a radioactive type material, or something that, you know, we would equate today to a radioactive material? Is that what they were doing? You know, I live near Yucca Mountain, so were they doing this in ancient times? I, I do not dismiss that. Uh, symbolic representations? Well, if there was 14 of these so-called unfinished pyramids scattered throughout Egypt, and we have the ancient myth of Osiris being scattered in 14 different places, is there a connection there? I wonder about that. Now I have a comment here on Anubis and the Dog Star and Sirius, and I I have made one video where I say that connection is possible, but to me, clearly the only alignment to what we call the Sphinx today is to the rising sun on the spring equinox. That is the only thing reflected by the earliest Egyptians, so I think that is the only alignment, and alignments are made to represent one day. I think it's clear that is the only alignment. Now, I have a question here from Anthony. I have a question. How much cooler is my balls now that I shave them? <laughs> now, I've had a lot of questions on Orion and the alignment of Giza and other things about Orion. And clearly to me, the pyramids are aligned to Orion's belt on the Giza Plateau. Just because so much of it is reflected in the ancient texts, with Anubis and Osiris and the afterlife. It just makes total sense to me. And I have not researched any more on Orion, but it keeps on popping up. And it's so clear to me that ancient cultures that just saw this as so significant. And it's related in the myths from the Mayans to the Native Americans to the Egyptians to the Sumerians. Everywhere. This is called the light of heaven to the Sumerians. And I stroll home some night, and I just look up at the sky, and it's just staring down at me, right on top of me. And it's all I see in the night sky, and I look up at it every time I come home. And Orion's belt. But what I see below Orion's belt is just the pyramid of these stars here. That just screams out at me. And maybe why pyramids are built in the pyramid shape. And of course, we have the Orion Nebula here. And if you follow Danny Wilton's channel, you know about the importance of that. Place of creation. Is that where we came from? As in our planet? Now here's a question. If the Great Pyramid was placed exactly on the important spot for ritual or astronomy, then how did they decide where to put all 100 or so other pyramids? Well... That is a great question, and I am actually looking into that. And I was reviewing some stuff Graham Hancock had to say in his Magicians of the Gods book, based on Haran and Gobekli Tepe in some ancient spots. So I might have a little further to say on this in the future, but that is something that takes a little while to decode or figure out. But that's a great question. Now, I have hinted at a video off the Nova Scotia coast about a mystery on an island. And of course, I'm referring to Oak Island. I've been looking into this for about three or four years. And I'm going to present something that you have never heard before about this mystery. It's not going to be the main focus of that video. But I'm going to tell you a story that you have never heard before. History is just an open suggestion box. And I'm certainly going to put an envelope in regarding this mystery. I said I was going to preview the Oak Island video in this video, but I kind of thought against that. There's some pretty smart people out there, and 
I want this information in my video to be really new and uh, people seem to uh, like working off of my videos and what I find but so I'm just gonna save that information for when the video comes out but a story yet to be told I have never heard it but it's gonna be part of a bigger story and a very important story just thought I'd mention that now I've had a few questions why don't you make another channel for your music videos well why would I do that when I have almost 45,000 subscribers on this channel start a channel with zero subscribers that seems kind of foolish the great thing about YouTube is you can make your channel about anything you want I have music I have ancient history on my channel and that's what my channel is all about and in in some way some of my music videos mean more to me than my history videos Dendel's just a good friend that I care about and music is her old life ancient history is just an interest of mine so in a way I care about those music videos a lot and I've told her that and she kind of gave me a weird look but she knows how I feel and she understands now I just want to thank the people for leaving the comments on my video about Leventa and the ancient handbags there's a lot of comments and that is something that I have no idea really I haven't put together a final answer and I think it's all a big mystery but here it says is the handbags more like a symbol of holding the keys other people have said are they the them holding the keys to knowledge others said uh, so even the Sumerians were carrying their wives purse <laughs> I like that one history repeats itself others said they were maybe offerings to the gods others said were they some sort of tool but there was a lot of good comments and that is just a great when people can just have an open debate about something that is a true mystery I guess now I've had people send me questions and comments and links about the shroud and ask me about my shroud research and how sure I am of what I state I have found uh, 110 percent the most surest research I've ever done what I found last fall that story in that sarcophagus I'm 110 percent sure more sure than any research I've ever done that I have found the sarcophagus of this gentleman here and I'm gonna prove it beyond a reasonable doubt in a future video I just wanted to state that and this is by far the most fascinating thing I've ever researched totally contradicted everything I believed about this time period and it is the only thing that I can back up in a debate at every single level and I am thoroughly convinced beyond a reasonable doubt and I'll discuss it with anybody that this right here this is not a hoax or a copy or a result of this but in fact this here is in fact a result of this and I know the whole story now I've had the question on aliens my thoughts and I have spoken out against some of the stuff mentioned on ancient aliens where they totally disregard history and just uh, totally blow stuff out of the out of proportion and I think it's pretty ridiculous but I have made videos where I have stated that I think the universe is full of life but as far as aliens traveling across the universe in a spaceship to get here I think we are missing something I think we are toddlers in the universal galactic knowledge maybe there's something more missing like dimensions or something that could explain it but I think life is prevalent in the universe and I've actually made a video that I'll talk about in my favorite books which I'm going to talk about in a second here but I think something happened to Roswell in 1947 that just based on my research of the deal something weird happened out there and I have talked about what seems like a message that we got at the Arecibo Space Observatory in the UK 
Seems to be a response from a message we sent a long time ago. I made a video about that if you just search my channel. But those are some of my thoughts on aliens. What about aliens and the Great Pyramid? Building the pyramids and stuff like that? Well, I do not dismiss it 100% because we simply do not know. Did aliens have some sort of intervention in the distant past? Well, we can't even wrap our heads around the last five, ten thousand years, let alone going back into way remote history. So I, I don't discount it. Seems something strange happened to our DNA maybe about forty five, fifty thousand years ago. But how and why that happened is all up for speculation. I do not discount aliens having some role in our ancient past, but there doesn't seem to be any concrete evidence of when and where. Just thought I would state that. Now oh, here's the question on the Sphinx. One more question I have is how long was it buried in the sand? It can't erode if it's below the ground. That would preserve it, if anything. What do you think, thanks? The Sphinx has to be a minimum of 10,000 years old. And I think it is uh, just under 12,000 years old myself based on everything that I've read and researched. That is my best guess. And I actually did a video maybe about three or four weeks ago on when did the Sphinx erode. That is a great mystery. And pretty much everything that has come down through history on the Sphinx to us is wrong. Now I want to talk about the Sumerians. And they have a lot of symbolism that I find fascinating. It seems to be a lot like Egypt. There seems to be a lot of anthropomorphic gods. There seems to be a lot of symbolism relating to the heavens and uh, creation and water. They probably related the Euphrates and the Tigris the same way the Egyptians thought of the Nile. But I just find all the symbolism in here pretty fascinating. And here is another one. It seems to be the tree of life and the bird god. Very important here, holding the handbag. But the birds seem to be like the spiritual connection between the earthly plane and the heavenly realm. Birds soaring, that just makes sense. Seems to be tree of life here. But some of the wing disc up here. But this symbolism seems to be the same as Egypt, but just told in a different way. The Anunnaki, I think, were just the people who brought civilization to these people. Just like the sages brought civilization, or the Shemsu Hor, the builder gods, brought civilization to Egypt. A lot of the same ideas, but told in a different fashion. And here is, I believe this is from the story of Gilgamesh. And this seems to be related to the very, very ancient flood. But also, it seems to be tied in to a story in the heavens. And Orion... And I made a video on that. And just search my channel if you want. But I find the Sumerians very interesting. This is ancient wisdom. And I will probably be making some videos on the Sumerians. But as I said, something I really haven't researched in depth. But they seem to have some of the oldest artifacts, or at least coming from the oldest periods that are recorded. In human history here, the Anunnaki, just think they were the creator gods, the ones who brought civilization to that part of the world. But there is a Sumerian king list that they say goes back hundreds of thousands of years. And is that just a misinterpretation of the ancient text? Probably. But something that Zachariah Sitchin wrote about, and wrote some pretty good fairy tales, but those books did have some good good information in them. But this is a website. I'll leave a link below. But they seem to have intricate knowledge of the heavens. Knowledge that really that they had back then should blow us away today. That they were able to document and record. Here are some things found here. A crystal lens and other things. But they seem to start civilization at a very early time in that part of the world. And here in this pic, you can see some symbolism here, the winged disc, or what looks like a winged disc. And here is a god dressed in fish symbolism. And what does this all mean? Well, I think 
that could come from simply these people came from the sea that gave knowledge to these people but it says the enuma elish epic of creation describes the half fish god yana coming from the water following the great deluge to bring knowledge to the sumerians so a lot of time just they related their gods to what they saw and if water was a place of creation then the people that brought creation to their culture were going to be associated with water that's about the simplest way i can put that but i know there's a lot of interest in this but this seems to go back maybe as old as ancient egypt but just developed in a different way of symbolism now i have had a lot of questions on some of my favorite books and i do have a playlist here these are in no specific order but uh the gods of edom by william bramley i thought that was just packed full of some interesting information not that i like totally agreed with his hypothesis but william bramley wrote a book full of i thought fascinating information the gods of eden it's called the day after roswell i mentioned that briefly the legacy of colonel philip corso ufo and et technology i thought this book was fascinating it tells the story of the roswell wreckage and what actually happened to that and how it got kind of put into uh, some industries and led to some amazing techno technological uh, advancements in our society and roswell initially i thought well it's kind of a far-fetched story this book was fascinating and it's really a human story of what happened and that's what really struck me and it really rang true with me so this is one of my favorite books today after roswell the Sphinx Mystery, The Sanctuary of Anubis, that led to my research on the Sphinx, and it's a fascinating book by Robert Temple. Some things he writes about I really have questions about, but The Sphinx Mystery, he nailed. Hamlet's Mill, a book by uh, Herbert von Decken and Giorgio de Santillana. Hamlet's Mill, you've heard John Anthony West talk about that, and that is just a great book that talks about really a really civilization that was highly advanced in astronomical uh, knowledge and other things and that kind of led to the myths that were encoded into temples all over the earth uh, Hamlet's Mill one of the most fascinating books I've ever read now the freakiest book I ever read hunt for the skinwalker and uh, George Knapp a local guy here was one of the authors of that book and it's really the only book that unnerved me that really kind of freaked me out and if you like paranormal stuff hunt for the skinwalker will definitely freak you out it certainly did me let's see other books here uh graham hancock of course fingerprints of the gods he wrote heaven's mirror the sign and the seal and uh the sphinx mystery and a whole bunch of other books I can't recommend Graham Hancock enough. Now at the bottom here, I have a book by John Anthony West, Serpent in the Sky, that I talked about a couple weeks ago. And I did a book review on a favorite book of mine from uh, last year that was called uh, Carol Lombard, Fireball and the Mystery of Flight 3. The story of her final days when she was out uh, raising money for uh, the war effort right after the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor and her plane crashed right here in Las Vegas her husband was Clark Gable and it's just a fascinating book about a fascinating time period and about early Las Vegas I thought I would just mention that that was a great book and I should also mention Ralph Ellis his books on how to interpret interpret biblical history and his views on that really really shaped how I went at the shroud research and none of that would have been possible if I hadn't read Ralph Ellis's books even though I dispute the conclusion to his book because it's certainly different than my research but Ralph Ellis certainly one of the most important authors I've ever read had to mention him even though he's not in this playlist here and there is a few books that I intend to read and some authors I intend to read 
I want to read uh, what Andrew Collins has to write, and also Robert Schock. Those are two people that you are familiar with that I want to check out their books. And there are a few other ones relating to matters of 2,000 years ago, and I'm just curious what, have, what people have to say about. And also, I have had questions. Have you ever thought about writing a book? Well, you'll just have to stay tuned, I guess, for that information to come out. But that is a playlist of some of my favorite books. I should also mention The Da Vinci Code is one of my favorite books. Not that it's a true story, but just pack full of really crucial information that really helped me out in my Templars research. But you know what? This video has gotten really, really long, and it looks like I might have to make a part two to my Q&A videos, but I went over a lot of questions. There are still some more that I want to go over, but I don't want to make this video over an hour. So I hope you enjoyed what I said, learned a little bit about me, where I come from, and uh, some more about what I know. Hope you thought this was cool, and you all have a very nice day.